Well, what's up guys and welcome back to my next reading session. Hope you're all doing fantastic. And today, as usual, we're going to continue with Seneca's letter from a Stoic. And today is going to be the letter 92nd on the happy life. So let's get started. You and I will agree, I think, that outward things are are sought for the satisfaction of the body, that the body is cherished out of regard of the soul, and that in the soul there are certain parts which minister to us, enabling us to move and to, sust into, and to sustain life, bestowed upon us just for the sake of the primary part of us. In, the pri in this primary part there is something irrational and something, and something rational. <coughs> The former obeys the latter, while the latter is the only thing that is not referred back to another, but rather refers to all things to itself. But rather refers refers all things to itself. For the divine reason also is set is in supreme command over all things, and is itself subject to known. And even this reason which we possess is the same because it is derived from the divine reason. Now, if we are agreed on this point, it is natural that we shall be agreed on the following also, namely, that the happy life depends upon this and this alone, our attainment of perfect reason. For it is not, but this that keeps the soul from being bowed down that stands its ground against fortune whatever the condition of their affairs may be it keeps men untroubled and that alone is a good which which is never subject subject to impairment that man i declare is happy whom nothing makes less strong than he is he keeps to the heights leaning upon known but but himself <coughs> For no, for, for one who sustains himself by any prop may fall. If the case is otherwise, then things which do not per, pertain to us will begin, begin to have great influence over us. But who desires fortune to have the upper hand or what sensible man prides himself upon that which is not his own? What is the happy life? It is peace of mind and lasting tranquility. This will be yours if you possess greatness of soul. It will be yours if you possess possesses the steady fastness that res, res, resolutely clings to a good judgment just rich. How does a man reach this condition? By gaining a complete view of truth, by maintaining in all that he does, order, measure, fitness, and a will that is inoffensive and kindly, that is intent upon reason and never departs therefrom, that commands at the same time love and admiration. In short, to give you the principle in brief compass, the wise man's soul ought to be such as would be proper for a god. What more? can one desire who possesses all honorable things. For if dishonorable things can contribute to the best estate, then there will be the possibility of a happy life under conditions which do not include an honorable life. <coughs> and what is more base or foolish than to connect the good of a rational soul with things rational? Yet there are certain philosophers who hold that the supreme good admits of increase because it is hardly complete when the gifts of fortune are advice. Adverse. Even anti Antipater, one of the great great leaders of this school, admits that he ascribes some influence of to externals, though only a very slight influence. You see, however, was 
what absurdity lies in not being content with the daylight unless it is increased by a tiny fire? What importance can a spark have in the midst of the of this clear sunlight? If you are not contented with only that which is honorable, it must follow that you desire, in addition, either the kind of quiet which the Greeks call undisturbedness or else pleasure. <clears throat> But the former may be attained in any case, for the mind fr is free from disturbance when it is fully free to contemplate the universe and nothing distracts it, it from the contemplation of, contemplation of nature. The second pleasure is simply the good of cattle. We are but adding the irrational to the rational, the dishonorable to the honorable. A pleasant physical sensation affects these this life of ours why therefore do you hesitate to say that all is well with a man just because all is well with his appetite do you rate i will not say among heroes but among men the person whose supreme good is, is a matter of flavors and colors and sounds nah let him withdraw from the ranks of these the noblest class of living beings second only to the gods let him herd with the dumb brutes an animal whose delight is in fodder the irrational part of the soul is twofold the one part is spirited ambitious uncontrolled it is seed is in the passions its seed is in the passions the other is lowly, sluggish, and devoted to pleasure. Philosophers have neglected the former, which, though unbridled, is yet better, and is certainly more courage, cour courageous and more worthy of a man, and have regarded the latter, which is never ner nerveless and, and ignoble, as indispensable to be happy life to the happy life <laughs> they have ordered reason to serve this letter they have made this the supreme good of the noblest living because being an abject and mean affair and a monstrous hybrid too composed of various members which harmonize but ill for as our Virgil describing Silla says above, a human face and maiden's priest, a beauteous priest below a monster hedge of bulk and shapeless with a dolphin's tail joined to a wolf-like belly. And yet to this Silla are tacked on the forms of wild animals, dreadful and swift, but, but from what monstrous shapes have these wise acres compounded wisdom? Man's primary art is virtue itself. There is joined to this day useless and fleeting flesh, fitted only for the reception of food, as Posidonius remarks. This divine virtue ends in fullness and to the higher parts, which are wor worshipful and heavenly. There is fastened a sluggish and fabby an fa flabby animal. As for the second, the desideratum, desideratum, quiet, although it would indeed not to itself be of any benefit to the soul yet it would relieve the soul of hindrances pleasure on the contrary on, on the contrary actually destroys the soul and softens all its vigor what elements so inharmonious inharmonious as these can be found united to that which is more virgos is joined that which is more sluggish, to that which is 
austere that which is far from serious to that which is most holy that which is unrestrained unrestrained even to the point of impurity what then come comes the resort re retort if good health rest and freedom from pain are not like likely to hinder virtue shall you not seek all this of course i shall seek them but not because they are goods i shall seek them because they are according to nature and because they will be acquired though the exercise of good judgment of, on my part what then will be good in them this alone that it is a good thing to choose them for when i don't suitable attire or walk as i should or dine as i ought to dine it is not my dinner or my walk or my dress that are goods but the deliberate choice which i show in regard to them as i observe in each thing i do i mean then that conform conforms which with reason let me also add that the choice of neat clothing is a fitting object of man's effort for man is by nature a neat and well-groomed animal hence the choice of neat attire and not neat attire in itself is a good since the good is not in the thing selected but in the quantity quality of the selection our actions are honorable but not the equal things which we do and you may assume that what i have said about dress applies also to the body for nature has surrounded our soul with the bo with the body as with a sort of garment the body as its clock but who has ever reckoned the value of clothes by the wardrobe which contained them this cupboard does not does not make this for good or bad therefore with regard to the body i shall return the same answer to you that if i have the choice i shall choose health and strength but that the good involved will be my judgment regarding these these things and not the things themselves another retort is granted that the wise man is happy nevertheless he does not attain this supreme good which we have defined unless the means also which nature proves for its attainment are at his call are at his hall call while one who possesses virtue cannot be unhappy yet not yet one cannot perfectly happy if one lacks such natural gifts as health or soundness of limb but in saying this you grant the alternative which seems the more difficult to believe that the man who is in the midst of unremitting and extreme part in extreme pain as not wretched nay is even happy and you deny that which is much less serious that he is completely happy and yet if virtue can keep a man from being wretched it will be the it will be an easier task for it to render him completely happy but the difference between happiness and complete happiness is less than with between wretchedness and happiness can it be possible that a thing which is so powerful as to snatch a man from disaster and place him among the happy cannot, cannot also accomplish what remains and render him supremely happy? Does its strength fail at the very top of the climb? There are in, the, in life things which are advantages and disadvantages, both beyond our control. If a good man, in spite of being weighed, weighed down by all kinds of disadvantages, is not 
wretched. How is he not supremely happy, no matter if he does lack certain advantages? Whereas he is not weighted down to wretchedness by his burden disadvantages. So he is not withdrawn from supreme happiness, though through lack of any advantages. Nay, he is just as supremely happy without the advantages, as he is free from wretchedness, though under the load of his disadvantages. Otherwise, if his good can be impaired, it can be snatched from him altogether. <clears throat> A short space above, I remarked that a tiny fire does not add to the sun's light. For, for by reason of this sun's brightness, any light that shines apart from the sunlight is blotted out. But one may say, there are certain objects that stand in the way even of the sunlight. The sun, however, is in, 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 unimpaired even in the midst of obstacles and through an object may intervene and cut off our view thereof. The sun sticks to his work and goes on his course. Whenever he shines forth from amid the clouds, he is not smaller nor less punctual either than when he is free from clouds. Since it makes a great deal of difference whether there is merely something in the way of his light or something which interferes with his shining. Similarly, obstacles take nothing away from virtue. It is no smaller but merely shines with less brilliancy. In our eyes, it may perhaps be less visible and less luminous than before. But as regards itself, in the same, in the same, and like the sun, when he, he is eclipsed, <clears throat> as still though in secret, putting f forth its strength. Disasters, therefore, and losses and wrongs, have only the same power over virtue that a cloud has over the sun. We meet with one person who maintains that a wise man who has met with bodily misfortune is neither wretched nor happy. But he also in, is in an error, for he is putting the results of chance upon a parity which with the virtues and is attributing only the same influence to things that are honorable as to things that, that are de devoid of honor. But what is more des detestable and more unworthy than to put contempt contemptible things in the same class <coughs> with things worthy of reverence? For reverence is due to justice, duty, loyalty, bravery, and prudence. Of this on the contrary. Those attributes are worthless, with which the most worthless men are often blessed in fuller measure, such as a sturdy leg, strong shoulders, good teeth, and healthy and solid muscles. Again, if the wise man, whose body is a trial to him, shall be regarded as neither wretched nor happy, but shall be left in a sort of a halfway position, his life also will be neither desirable nor, nor undesirable. But what is so foolish as to say that the wise man's life is not desirable, and what is so far beyond the bounds of credence as the opinion that any life is neither desirable nor undesirable? Again, if bodily ills do not make a man wretched, they consequently allow him to be happy for things which have no power to change his condition for the worse, have not the power either to disturb that condition when it is at the, its best. 
But someone will say, we know what is cold and what is hot. A lukewarm temperature lies between. Similarly, A is happy and B is wretched, and C is neither happy nor not wretched. I wish to examine the, this figure, which is brought into play against us. If I add your if I add to your lukewarm water a larger quantity of cold water, the result will be called cold water. But if I pour in a larger quantity of hot water, the water will be finally will finally become become hot. In the case, however, of your man who is neither rich nor happy, no matter how much I add to his troubles, he will not be unhappy, according to your argument. Hence, your figure offers no analogy. Again, suppose that I said before you a man who is neither miserable nor happy. I add blindness to his misfortunes. He is not rendered unhappy. I cripple him. He is not rendered unhappy. I add afflictions which are unceasing and severe. He is not rendered, rendered unhappy. Therefore, one whose life is not changed to misery by all these ills is not dragged by them, either from his life of happiness. <clears throat> Then, if, as you say, the wise man cannot fall from happiness to wretchedness, he cannot fall into non-happiness. For how, if one has begun to sleep, can one stop at any particular place? That which prevents him from rolling to the bottom keeps him, keeps him at the summit. Why, you urge may not a happy life possibly be destroyed. I cannot even be disjoined. And for that reason, virtue is itself, of itself, sufficient for the happy life. But, it is said, is not the wise man happier if he has lived longer and has been distracted by no pain than one who has always who has always been compelled to grapple with evil fortune, answer to me, is he any better or more honorable? If he's not, then he's not happier either. In order to live more happily, he must live more right, rightly. If he cannot do that, then he cannot live more happily either. Virtue cannot be straight, st strained either and therefore neither can the happy life which depends on virtue for virtue is so great a, a good that it is not affected by such insignificant assaults upon it as shortness of life pain and the various bodily vexations for pleasure does not deserve that. Virtue should even glance at it. <clears throat> now what is the chief thing in virtue? It is the quality of not needing a single day beyond the present, present and, not, and of not reckoning up the days that are ours. In the slightest possible moment of time, virtue completes, com completes and eternity of good. These goods seems to us incre incredible and transcending man's nature, who we measure its grandeur by the standard of our own weakness, and we call our vices by name of virtue. Furthermore, does it not seem just as incredible that any man in the midst of extreme suffering should say, am I happy? And yet this utterance was heard in the very factor of pleasure, 
when Epicurus said, said Today and one other day have been the happiest of all, although in the one case he was tortured by strangury, strang, strangury and in the other by the incurable pain of an, an un, un, ulcerated stomach. Why then should these goods, which virtue bestows, be incredible in the sight of us? who cultivate virtue when they are found even in those who acknowledge pleasure as their mistress. They are also ignoble and base-minded as they are declared that even in the midst of excessive pain and misfortune the wise man will be neither rash nor happy. And yet this also is incredible, nay, still more incredible than the other case for I do no, for I do not understand how if virtue falls from her heights she can help being hurled all the way to the bottom she either must preserve one is happy happiness or if driven from this position she will not prevent us from becoming unhappy if virtue only stands her ground she cannot be driven from the felt she must either conquer or be conquered. <clears throat> but some say only the immortal gods is given virtue and the happy life. We can attain but the shadow, as it were, and semblance of such goods as theirs. We approach them, but we never reach them. Reason, however, is a common attribute of both God and man. In the gods, it is already perfect, perfected. In us, it is capable of being perfect, perfected. But it is our vices that bring us to despair. For the second class of rational being, man is of an inferior order, a garden, as it were, who is too unstable to hold fast, fast to what is best, his judgment still wa wavering and uncertain. He may require the faculties of sight and hearing, good health, a bodily exterior that is not loathsome, and besides, greater length of days conjoined with the unimpaired constitution. Though by means of reason, he can lead a life which will not bring regrets Yet there resides, resides <clears throat> in the imperfect creature, man, a certain power that makes for badness because he possesses a mind which is easily moved to perversity. Suppose, however, the badness which is in full view and has previously been stirred to activity to be removed. The man is still not a good man but he is being molded to goodness. One, however, in whom there is lacking any quality that makes for goodness, is bad. But he is whose body virtue dwells, and spirit, air, present, is equal to the gods. Mindful of his origin, he strives to return Thither. No man does wrong in attempting to retain the heights from which he once came down. And why should you not believe that something of divinity in exists in one who is a part of God? All this universe which encompasses All the universe which encompasses us in one, and it is God. We are sus sus associates of God. We are his members. Our soul has capabilities and is carried thither. If vices do not hold it down, just as it is the nature of our bodies to stand erect and look upward to the sky, so the soul 
which may reach out as far as it will, was, firm, f was framed by nature to this end, that it, sh that it should desire equality with the gods. And if it makes use of its powers and stretches upward into the, its proper region, it is by no alien part that is it struggles towards the heights. It would be a great task to journey heavenwards. The soul but returns thither. When once it has found the road, it boldly marches on, scornful of all things. It casts no, no backward glance at wealth. Gold and silver, things which are fully worthy of the gloom in which they once lay. It well is known by this sheen when smites the eyes of the ignorant, but the, but the mire of ancient days, whence our great first detached and dug them out. <coughs> The soul, I affirm, knows that riches are stored elsewhere than in man's hip, hipped up treasure houses. That it is the soul and not the strong, strong box which should be filled. It is the soul that man may set in domination over all things and may install as owner of the universe so that in may, so that in may it may limit it reaches only by the boundaries of east and west, and, like the gods, may possess all things, and that it may, with its own vast resources, look down from on high upon the wealthy, not one of whom rejoices as much as his own wealth, as he resents the wealth of another. When the soul has transported itself, to, to hit this lofty high, it regards the body also, since it is a burden which must be borne not as a thing to love, but as a thing to oversee, nor as it subservient to that over which it is set in mastery. For no man is free who is a slave to his body. Indeed, amid an omitting all the other masters which brought into being by excessive care for the body, this way which the body itself ex exercise, exercises as captious and fastidious. For from the, this body the soul issues now with unruffled spirit, now with ex exaltation and when once it is has gone forth it has gone forth asks not what shall be the end of the deserted day <clears throat> no just as we do do not just as we do not take thought for the clippings for the hair and the bread bared even so that divine soul when it is about to issue forth from the mortal man, regards the destination of its earthly vessel, whether it is, whether it be consumed by fire, or shunned in by a stone, or buried in the earth, or torn by wild beasts, as being of more concern to itself that, than is the afterbirth to a child just born, and whether this body shall be cast out and plucked to pieces by birds, or the wooden, the word, the word, when thrown to the sea dogs as prey. How does that concern him who is nothing? Nay, even when it is among the living, the soul fears nothing that may happen to be to the body after death, for though such things may have been threats. They were n not enough to terrify the soul previous to the moment of death. It says, I'm not frightened by the executioner's hoof, 
nor by the, the revolting mutilation of the corpse which is exposed to the scorn of those who would witness this spectacle. I ask no man to perform the last rites for me. I entrust my remains to none. Nature has made provision that none shall go unburied. Time will lay away one whom cruelty has cast forth. Those who are eloquent words with my essence uttered, Masinus, Masinus uttered, I want no tomb, for nature da does provide for out outcast bodies burial. I would imagine that this was the saying of a man of strict principles. He was indeed a man of noble and robust, na robust native gifts, but in prosperity he impaired these gifts by la laxness. Farewell. All right, guys, so that was a long letter today, and tomorrow it's going to be a short one. So thank you for joining me today. See you tomorrow in the next letter. Bye.